so uh, welcome everybody. Um, I am extremely thrilled today to be co-presenting this webinar with two of the brightest and accomplished folks in the field of innovation and co-creation. Uh, my name is Vivek uh, Bhaskaran. I'm one of the founders here at Ideascale. And uh, I started Ideascale with Rob Hohen back in 2009, 2010, and it's been uh, a wild ride in this open innovation journey that, and crowdsourcing journey that we've been together, really. Uh, I have with me a Herman Gehr, uh, an accomplished author, and in the last few months, actually a very good friend of mine, my road, road riding partner. He's, re he's written a couple of books uh, in the field of innovation and what it really means to be innovative, uh, especially under the context of Silicon Valley here and in the Bay Area. Uh, more importantly, he and his wife, uh, Lisa, as well as his partner, Laszlo Jarofi, um, have invented this model called CoStar uh, that I've been you know, exposed to in the last six months. Uh, and I've really been uh, really massively impressed with what they've done in terms of kind of you know, organizing innovation, really. Uh, and I'm very excited that he's presenting with us today. So Herman's with, uh, with us today. I also have Pat Young. Um, he currently runs his own consulting shop called We Create out of London. Uh, and he was uh, formerly the, uh, the GM of Travel Channel. Uh, and also, uh, you know, by the way, Travel Channel, and while well, he was at Travel Channel, uh, using the CoStar process, uh, they came up with man versus food, really. I'm definitely excited to hear about the history and the story behind uh, behind the creation of Man V Food. That's you know that's going to be an, an interesting uh, interesting conversation there. He was also the chief creative officer of BBC, uh, where he you know created an internal innovation portal called iCreate for internal employees of BBC uh, to come and pitch ideas and pitch uh, ideas for shows and uh, and things like that. So you know I'll I'll let him talk about that um, a little bit. So. Um, uh, so that that's about it. Uh, these are the couple of books that Herman has written, uh, and the, the key one being the Dynamic Enterprise, and of course uh, the book on CoStar, really. Uh, so at this point, um, I would like to hand it over to Herman over here. I'm going to make Herman the presenter, and there we go. Take it away, Herman. Please tell us about you know innovation in the enterprise, Silicon Valley, and CoStar. Herman, take it away. Very good. Thank you very much, Vivek. Uh, it is truly uh, wonderful to to have the opportunity to to have this conversation with all of you. Um, and I thought what I would want to do is uh, start with giving you a little bit of a larger context of why is innovation so important today in particular. Um, this was a picture that many of us saw in the last year. Uh, it shows the Pope election uh, in 2005 and then in 2013, and as you can see in that picture, something very profound has happened in that in that relatively short time frame. Something occurred in that time frame that mobilized a kind of different spirit in our humanity. It it changed who we are really. It it lifted certain kinds of uh, capabilities out of us into our lives that allow us to connect with others, to interact with others, to share with others. And I think that while some look at this picture as kind of, you know, startling or may maybe even frightening, I actually see it as quite, quite uh, hopeful and 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 inter certainly very interesting and, and relevant to the conversation we're having today. How do we hook into this shift in in how we go about our daily lives and how we communicate and how we learn and how we uh, connect with others? Um, driven, of course, this is by by the uh, internal by, by, by the by the uh, the computer chip, right? That continues to evolve at rapid rates, doubling in power every 18 months. And so it means that today we live in an exponential time. We live in a time where constantly things are being disrupted, turned over. And my very good friend uh, Kurt Carlson, who was until very recently the CEO of SRI International, uh, the, the developers of the mouse and the graphic user interface, GPS and things like that, uh, made the point that in this exponential time, if you improve your performance incrementally, you actually fall behind exponentially. And what that means is that in today's, in this world that we're talking about here, that we're all part of now, if you, we are in an enterprise and we just do a little better every year, it might feel great. You know, In the old days, that would have been enough. But today, doing a little bit better is not enough. There's, you know, we got to keep our eyes on the next thing that could disrupt us. 
the next thing that we need to start to claim. And in that respect, you know, think of Nokia. Nokia in 2007 was the dominant uh, company in the space of mobile telephony, and look at where they are today. Now, Andre Perold, similar to Kurt, makes this statement. In that wild and, and, and extraordinary world, if you find yourself in a market transaction, do not know for sure that you're the wolf, then sadly, you are the sheep. And why I like this, uh, this statement from, from Perold is that it is in, you know, that, that world that Kurt so effectively described, if you do not redefine your territory over and over again, if you don't understand how you need to position yourself in these new markets, in these new transformed environments, you are always at risk to be disrupted by some, someone else, by another, you know, another uh, company that will define the territory and will define it around you. You know, you can think of nearly any industry that's been disrupted in the last few years, music, uh, what's happening with taxis, what's happening with hotels. These are signals that somebody missed an opportunity to, to, to you know, stay connected to what's really going on around them, to, to, to maintain, you know, sort of the focus on these massive developments. So interestingly, while this is going on, and this is a, this is a statement from Gary Hamill from a few years ago, where he, where he makes it clear that most leaders of companies are quite clear that the world is moving fast and that therefore every company needs to do a better job at innovation. But then when you go into these organizations and ask people, what's going on? How do you innovate? You actually get blank looks because they have no system. And so that became a really interesting question to us is how could, we, how could that be and what can we do to actually reverse that? How can we empower companies to effectively innovate? What are the sort of fundamentals to innovation? And that's what we want to talk about with you today. And I'm really, really excited about this collaboration with, with uh, Ideascale to develop now a platform that makes it actually very easy and very straightforward to implement an innovation system inside uh, of, of an enterprise, inside companies. Now. You know, in our search to discover what is it that makes a sort of systematic approach to innovation, it became apparent, you know, we are here in Silicon Valley, so we live in a laboratory of innovation, and it became apparent to us quite quickly that this is a discipline. This is something that, you know, is akin to any other discipline. You know, think of medicine, think of um, martial arts, think of, you know, systematic approaches to succeeding in a particular kind of effort in a particular kind of territory. And so in this case, you know, we looked, of course, right into in our neighborhood. Something really spectacular and special is happening in Silicon Valley. What's happening here? You know, we, we ha have most of the venture capital money in America spent here. Uh, there are, it's, it's a lively place with a lot of people spending their time, you know, doing innovation effectively with 4,000 deals being done with universities where students Start create startups out of their out of their um, out of uh, dormitories. So, what's going on here? We asked ourselves, and there, there's sort of the fundamental that we discovered is this valley is driven by VC, and by VC we mean venture capital, of course. And what's interesting is that when you look at how how venture capitalists succeed and how very different they are from, let's say corporate environments where also innovation is being done. There was a study a few years ago by, by uh, Dublin at, uh, that was published in Business Week that showed that on average the, the, the success of, 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 of um, innovation initiatives is about 4.5 percent in corporations. And when you look at venture capitals, capitalists, you know, at the time they looked at a 31 percent success rate. You know, so 31% of all the investments that make that they make is at least at least meets the the expectations they have for those investments versus the four and a half percent on average in industry. Huge difference. What's the difference? That's the next VC. The next VC has to do with with value creation. That is, venture capitalists focus on making sure not that there's an idea that's cool but that the idea that's being developed has real value. And, by, and that's what I want to go into some detail now about how, the, how we can ensure that the kind of idea, ideation process that we want to pursue in our companies 
actually delivers you know, the value that we're looking for, that we need in order to succeed in the world that I described to you earlier, right? So here's just a quick sort of notion, again, about the discipline and how innovation generally flows when it, when it succeeds. So initially, in a good innovation system, there's always a, a piece to it that has to do with the exploration of the opportunity, right? Do you understand what's going on in the external environment, what the new developments are, what the next disruptions are, what some startups are starting to develop that's going to become potentially something very big and disruptive. Do you understand these opportunities? Are you connected to institutions like the Institute for the Future? Those kind of things. And are you bringing that information into your enterprise? Do you make it available to everyone to see how the world around you is evolving? What are the opportunities that exist? And where could you then go to the next phase, which is to develop really interesting breakthrough ideas into these kind of spaces? So that's the next phase of effective innovation is the generation of breakthrough ideas. And you know, again, platforms like what you're going to see in a minute are focused to allow large numbers of people to generate really good ideas. But now then, also to go to the third phase, which is another really important you know, aspect to this Silicon Valley approach, which is the optimization of these ideas. Very often the first idea is not necessarily a very good idea, right? But what's really interesting again here in Silicon Valley is that there's sort of this spirit that says, well, we start with something and then we engage with others, we look to expertise, we test it in the market and we optimize the value of what we have initially thought could be a good idea. And very often, innovators that started with one kind of idea shift, they pivot, and develop something quite different from what they originally thought. But that's where the value is, right? They understand that, that the goal is not to necessarily develop the very first thing they thought of, but to create something that actually has value in the market. Then finally, you select, you know, if there's a selection process, Again, you're going to see on the platform the possibility of actually engaging on a platform to help people select and then to take it to market and mobilize for results and you know incubate an idea and put it, you know put it through a, a kind of process that gets the investment in place that allows it then to go to market. So these are the five fundamental aspects of this discipline. Inside that, there is a very very simple fundamental methodology go anywhere in Silicon Valley to a cafe like Hoopa Cafe or to, a, to, a, to, to Starbucks or to you know, the local restaurant and there is a buzz. There are people constantly pitching ideas, exchanging, seeing whether they can get some input from their friends, from, their, like, from experts that they take out to lunch, etc. So the most important aspect of this, this world here is the ability to actually effectively pitch something and pitch an idea that is focused on customer value. A fundamental law in this place is that if it's just an idea, it has very little meaning. You go to, an, a, you go to a venture capitalist and say, I have, a, I have a wonderful idea, they say, good for you. If you say, I have an idea and I think I know exactly who is going to, you know, who's interested in it and what pro problems it solves, they're going to say, well, show me more. So that's the fundamental definition of innovation. An innovation is an idea that has value, that has customer value. But how do you ensure? as you develop an idea as an innovator, that it in fact has value. There are a few fundamental aspects to a value proposition, and we call them CoStar, right? CoStar is the idea that if we can, if we can understand what are the fundamental elements of a good value proposition, then people can all, you know, have the same language. They all understand what they're talking about as they describe an idea, and they can they can communicate with each other much more effectively and help optimize an idea. So here's CoStar. Hey, Herman, um, I have a quick question over here. Uh, can, you, can you let us know, I mean, I know you came up with case CoStar. Can you let us know how you actually came up with this idea for CoStar? Uh, well, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, I pointed at it a little bit, and that is that it's happening here. Something really special is happening, and we kept thinking, what is it? What is the unique aspect of what's going on. And so we went to pitching competitions and listened to how people were pitching their ideas. And we listened not only to how they pitched, but the questions that they were being asked by, by venture capitalists, by the people who, by experts. And it was always the same questions. Who is your customer? You know, if, if, if an innovator 
uh, didn't didn't mention the customer in a meaningful kind of way, that was always going to be a question. Or is there some kind of technical development that's behind this this idea? Or questions like, who are you working with? Who's on your team? What what kind of what what is the you know the, the, the advantage? Do you understand who you're competing with? So by looking at those questions, we began to see that they're, they're these fundamentals to a good value proposition. And they can be understood, they're very straightforward, and when you use them, magic happens, right? Because instantaneously, you know what you have to cover as an innovator in terms of making your idea, ensuring that your idea has real value, that your idea can, can evolve to something that you know, ultimately becomes a viable proposition that go, can go to market. Of course, then we studied all the different formats that existed in Silicon Valley. There's Kawasaki, and SRI has an interesting uh, value proposition. And so we looked at all the different um, existing templates and tools, and then you know intermingled that understanding with what we saw in these pitching competitions and created CoStar. So let me tell you what CoStar is. So C stands for customer. And you know that's the, that's the core. If you don't understand your customer, your idea doesn't have a value. And so we want to know who the customer is for the idea. What's their important problem? Are you solving something that they really care about? What is the unmet need that your your solution can address? The other question is how many of those customers are? Who are they? Are they young people? Are they older people? Are they women? Are they men? And what do they? What are they willing to pay for you to solve this problem? So you know that whole idea of understanding deeply who this 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 customer is that your idea is going to buy your idea ultimately. It's going to use your idea is fundamental to defining whether it has a value. An idea with no customers has zero value, right? It's obvious. The next is O is opportunity. So. Not all ideas think of you know Steve Jobs. He created a whole bunch of things where there was no apparent customer need, but he saw an opportunity. He saw trajectories of technological developments of, of a potential in the market that he said, "I want to go there." You know that's back to the analogy of the wolf and the and the sheep. Do you see a territory that you can say this is coming? Nobody out there, no customer yet knows that this is where they're going to be customer in the not too distant future. We're going to take advantage of that and we're going to create something. We can create a new ecosystem, a new market uh, environment that you know people are going to flock to once they can see what it is. So the next one then is a solution, right? Now I want to know what your idea is. If you understand the customers, if you can claim specifically what the opportunity is, then please let me know what your solution is, right? What, how do you satisfy the need that you identified or seize the opportunity? What are the key fu features and functions? And what kind of business are you going to be in with this, new, with, this new, with this solution? What kind of business model is going to drive your success? The team that is the T of CoStar, it's very interesting. One of the things we saw as we watched venture capitalists respond to pitches in, in these competitions is they always look to who, the, who is on the team. Very often they are more inclined to invest in a team of really good people with very good experience than they are in the idea itself. So this is this is really a fundamental feature of a good value proposition that that gives you know gives that that defines value. Value is often that you have people who really work hard who are you know getting up in the middle of the night uh, you know managing the development of the idea. Next is the advantage, right? Do you understand who else is in that space? How is your, your, you know, do you understand the alternatives? Can you name them? How is your solution going to be better than everybody else's? And what is the specific thing, that unfair competitive advantage that your idea has over the others? Do you understand that? It's very important to know because, you know, if I'm going to invest your idea, I don't want to invest in something that is already existing in the market. And finally, of course, we want to know what are the results you're going to deliver with that? What are the quantifiable benefits for the customers, but also the returns, of course, to the, to the enterprise, to the investors? Are we going to get our money back and more, and then some? And so, you know, how, how do you get benefits both in terms of the more tangible things and the more intangible things, and how do you manage the risks and the trade-offs? All right, so that's CoStar, and what's been and now it's it, it, we know that it's being practiced in about 36 countries now. It's quite exciting, and maybe on the basis of this uh, webinar, who knows where it's going to go next? Um, 
But what's really been wonderful to see, in, and you're going to probably hear something a little bit about that from Pat, is that, that, that the wonderful thing about this very simple tool and making it available on a platform like the IdeaScale platform is that it creates kind of an easy guide for people, for the innovators to quickly put together a really good idea in a way that ensures that it's, it has value. It allows other people to easily engage. If I pitch your co-star, you can quickly say, hey, Herman, you got this not quite right about the competition, or you don't quite see the, that customer the way I see it. You can, we can have very productive conversations. And then with each iteration, the idea gets better and more refined and ultimately allows it to quite naturally get to a place where it goes from a very early pitch all the way to a very compelling business plan and a very clear business model. So it's not like all of a sudden a group that's working on innovation is to go, oh God, now we have to put together a business plan. No, the, the, the sharpening of the co-star, the deepening of it, the adding to it is quite a normal and very natural way of getting ultimately to a very a very compelling kind of business plan. So there you have it. That's what we have learned. That's the background I wanted to give you in terms of how this kind of exponential innovation gets done in this very disrupted, very interesting and demanding world that we now have entered. All right. Thank you so much. That was that was a refreshing primer over there uh, on CoStar, really. Um, and uh, I'm going to switch uh, switch gears right now, uh, and um, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to do a quick presentation on uh, how we at IdeaScale uh, have implemented CoStar as part of um, as part of the platform itself um, uh, to give you a sense. Um, obviously, I, I look at CoStar as kind of creating these swim lanes for each for each particular kind of segment and, and really kind of channeling thought across each of those swim lanes, really. Uh, so I'm going to go through a quick demo of what we have uh, implemented with IdeaScale. Um, and then, and after that, we'll just, you know, and then I'd like to kind of, you know, switch it over to uh, Pat, who can give us some more, uh, some more uh, ideas into uh, what he's actually done uh, with, uh, uh, I don't think I'm muted. Uh, can you get you can hear me right? No, we can hear you. Oh, okay, yeah, good. All right, good. So, okay, okay, perfect. So I think Susan says uh, okay. So uh, so let me let me go through the demo and then um, and then um, we'll switch it over to Pat who can give us some very practical examples of how he implemented this co starter model uh, in BBC. So uh, so you can see my screen over here. So we are in an innovation community for you know hosted by um, IdeaScale. You can look at all the ideas. Um, you can post ideas. Um, and one of the challenges, there are two ways we can implement CoStar um, effectively. Uh, either all the all the ideas that are posted in a particular community are CoStar enabled, or uh, a few of the campaigns within um, a few of the campaigns within uh, within IdeaScale are CoStar enabled. Um, this is the community that you can see. It's a it's a it's a community for a phone company, and you know all kinds of ideas have been posted for that uh, for that phone company really. And one of the campaigns is Visions for 2020 over here. Um, so we will go into that campaign and see you know this as you can see is a CoStar enabled campaign. So you can see CoStar as part of that. And I posted an idea about yesterday about a Bitcoin phone wallet really. Um, and I can go in there and look at the not only the executive summary. Uh, but also, as um, Herman earlier described, uh, I can go in and put in uh, content um, and really kind of channel my thought about. So here's my idea about a Bitcoin phone wallet, and then I want to think about who the who the customer is, who's going to use that, um, and and go through that process of you know describing the opportunity, describing the solution, describing the team, as well as the advantage and the result. Really, so this uh, for each of these components, we can. Uh, we can drill down into it, um, and the cool part over here uh, with an idea scale, because frankly we we believe in crowdsourcing. Uh, it's not only me who is uh, editing the content over here. Uh, we I can uh, effectively solicit uh, team members uh, to come in and edit. Uh, and expand upon each of the components, so you can expand upon different, you know, from, you know different pieces of the uh, different pieces of the puzzle. Um, and I can, you know, solicit people from the sales department to say, hey, look, this is my idea. You know, how can you help me expand the customer piece, the customer co-star piece of that idea, really? 
Uh, and if it, if it, you know, if it comes to team, I can go talk to HR and say, hey, look, you know what, this is my idea. I want to know what are the different kind of skills that we have in place or who are the people that I can I can solicit in terms of who are the people that we can get people um, into 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 the process. So it's almost like the like like Herman said earlier on, kind of the, the beginning stages of a a business plan, if you will. And this, I think, I think, I think the point you're making, Vivek, is really fundamental. You know, to the notion of when you say it's a co-star enabled or a co-star empowered uh, platform, it creates a really different kind of community engagement than a a, a, you know, a, a more generic crowdsourcing platform where, you know, mostly people just give very uh, open-ended kind of feedback. But what you're suggesting right now is really critical to this, which is that you can get much more focused feedback. You know, the questions that you have become apparent and the community, you know, is very actively engaged to actually help you out. So there's this sort of natural collaborative atmosphere. Exactly. So, um, and just I'll just quickly go through the kind of the, the, the kind of the administrative aspect of it. Um, most of you guys who've been uh, with IdeaScale, um, you can probably are familiar with the interface. This is the backend interface for a particular community um, or a particular account, if you will. Um, if you go to the advanced settings, you'll see an option for CoStar over here, um, and then you can either turn it off or on on a particular community basis. Um, and the settings are fairly straightforward, realistically. Um, you can either turn it off for all your, you know, turn it on for all your campaigns. So effectively, the entire community is CoStar enabled. Or in this particular case, what we've done is the vision for 2020 is CoStar enabled. The rest of the campaigns are not CoStar enabled. So um, there's a fair amount of flexibility in terms of how you want to bring CoStar into the into the process. Um, you know, obviously, we as a technology company, we are not, you know, forcing you to, you know, follow one process versus the other. But we obviously think the uh, the, the mechanism of doing this is very powerful, and we've seen obviously with you know as as Herman has said, and now as we'll hear from Pat, uh, uh, how it has actually impacted and uh, impacted um, the innovation uh, innovation process uh, for both the Travel Channel and BBC. So I think uh, that's actually another really important point: is not every campaign needs to be co-star enabled. It's it's you know just not necessary for certain topics to be pursued at that level of depth. You know uh, where. Yeah, there we go. It's, so that's, I think that's very interesting. All right, good. Uh, perfect. So I'm going to switch it over to Pat right now. I'm going to make Pat the presenter. Uh, so Pat, take it away. Uh, enlighten us about you know Man V Food as well as Travel Channel as well as uh, I Create. Okay, thanks, Vivek. Thanks, Herman. Um, so I ran the Travel Channel, which is an American cable network in about 95 million homes. And I ran it from 2005 through 2010. And we did a lot of strategy work looking at how we could be more than a middling sized network with middling ambitions and middling returns. And we saw that because of our relatively small size compared to other networks in the company, we were part of the discovery group, um, we could be much more agile and digital was there. And because travel and digital sort of go together, mobility, was an emerging trend, um, smartphones were just being introduced. We thought that um, if we could get ahead in digital, we could probably get ahead of the game and redefine our business in a new way for a new age. Um, and so we introduced the CoStar process because we knew that we weren't any longer just trying to come up with television program ideas, which is a sort of fairly straightforward process. We now needed to come up with ideas which, which extended beyond the screen which extended to mobile, to apps, uh, to the real world, uh, to the web. And so uh, CoStar was great because, first of all, it introduced that discipline um, about doing things which are important rather than things which are interesting. For those of you who are in the creative space, um, you know we have what I call the shiny blue thing moment where a shiny blue thing goes past and everybody goes, oh, that looks really interesting and you all go and chase it, but actually we need to focus on things which were significant and important rather than just interesting. And CoStar, with its emphasis on the consumer and the opportunity, um, gave us a discipline around value which was very, very um, helpful. Um, second thing about CoStar is it gave us a common language. Um, and a common language is really, really important. When you're talking to people um, you've got your finance team, you've got your uh, ad sales team, you've got your affiliate sales team, you've got your program makers. Having a common language and a common way about how you build an idea 
doesn't just um, make it easier for more people to get engaged and we very much made this a, a whole business exercise everybody in the business had a role to play in helping us define our future having a common language certainly helps with that but it also helps massively with the feedback because the feedback can be around the elements of co-star making it much less personal um, I, you know, so if I say I don't really understand who the consumer is that isn't saying Steve I think you're barking up the wrong tree I can make the question about the co-star element rather than the individual that's put the, the proposal together so um, I mean so we introduced it in 2007 and in 2008 we um, it it was CoStar that helped us develop Man vs. Food, and hopefully you can see my presentation um, now. Yep. Can you see it? Now? Yep, we can. Yep. So, um, what's interesting about CoStar is a great tool for helping you build your ideas. When you actually present them, you you don't necessarily present them in C O S T A R in that order. What you have to make sure is that all of the elements are introduced and uh, and covered. So, first of all, on the consumer side, evidence. Uh, that food was travel. Um, in a 2005 uh, research, dining was the number one activity for domestic American travelers. And then we had something more esoteric from our own website with people who'd been to um, somewhere that was on the travel channel and had written about it. And somebody yeah, else had done that. Full, can you go to full screen on your PowerPoint? Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, is that full screen now? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, second, do we really have food covered? We were the network of Anthony Bourdain, No Reservations, and Andrew Zimmons, Bizarre Food. The problem was Bourdain's very edgy, and Andrew eats things that most people would run a mile from. So even though we did food, you know, there was a consumer opportunity that we weren't really addressing, which was straightforward Americana food that's very accessible to our viewers. Um, other consumer insight. Our competitors, the Food Network, were, were already moving into this space and were doing very well. Uh, so they were starting to do travel type show, but we thought we could do them better. So how big was the opportunity? Well, when we looked at our own evidence, we had a show called Hamburger Paradise, which was already our number one show for our, our heaviest viewers. And we also had a show called The World's Best Places to Pig Out. Um, you know, the 12 foot pizza or the, the three pound, the, yeah, the four pound steak. And that show had aired 113 times and was still outperforming the slot. Now, this is where we get granular, but having evidence on which to base decisions is really, really vital because it isn't just, I think this is a great idea. What they're telling me here is this stuff works with our audience. Uh, and its popularity had even got it onto Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. So it was in the zeitgeist. We had something special here if we knew what to do with it. So how do you make it work for us? And then we came to the story, the story or the solution, man versus food. And what they showed me here was a, a two-minute taster tape of, of the host, Adam Richmond. Um, so a page here, meet Adam. So just some, And literally, this is how they pitched it to me. Um, you know, this was his life calling. He was a comedian uh, at the time working, doing videotape recording at Madison Square Garden, but actually kept a journal of all of his restaurant experiences for about 10 years. Um, the, the, again, on the story about the show, it's not about competitive eating. It's an ultimate, what they called food porn show. These are real places that people can go to. So you can see the texture here of what they're putting into this pitch. Here's what a sample episode looks like. They'll go to these three places in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and you get a sense of how the show works and what the challenge is. Um, and it's, it's all over America. So this isn't local. This is something that, you know, if we want a show that actually Americans feel they can buy into, this show has pan-USA appeal. So in terms of what team we need and what advantage, and talking to that emerging digital period that we were in, here was the, the whole value chain for this show. So you could watch it on television and be entertained and inspired, and you could have short form content on video on demand. You could go online to our website and investigate the places that he went to and download the map. You could purchase, you could go there and you could buy, buy the product and you could prepare. So Adam would do tips on how to take on the particular culinary challenge. You could go there yourself and you could try the experience and then you could take pictures and videos and you could put them on our website. 
So that told us that this had to involve our TV team, our web team, our sales team, our affiliate team. If we were going to capture the full value of this one idea, all of these different parts of the business needed to be involved. In terms of the sales opportunities, they, they range from the hotels he stayed in and the cars he drove, drove through to the uh, indigestion tablets that he'd have to take afterwards. And then the benefits, it would skew younger, we could go international, we could do it live, it's a good event opportunity, it can play on multiple nights, it's water cooler, um, and it could play in all these other places. It would do well on iTunes, it would be great viral content for YouTube and other sites. Um, we could even buy another website called roadfood.com, which we didn't do. But this was a deck which was pulled together by my ad sales team, by my um, television um, a scheduler and by an executive producer, a team that never normally would come together, but they had this idea and CoStar gave them the language to optimize the idea and put it in front of me in a way that was easily understood and easy to uh, to move with. And Man vs. Food, if you've never seen it, if you Google it, uh, if you look on YouTube, you'll find it, went on very quickly to be the biggest uh, show in the channel's history for about five or six years and became a genuine cultural phenomena with the host appearing on all of the late night talk shows and the host is now himself you know, a minor celebrity. Uh, I left the Travel Channel in 2009, at the end of 2009, and came back to the UK to run BBC Production. Now BBC Production, a very different beast. Um, BBC Production, 3,000 people in eight bases, with a range of genres, so comedy, entertainment, drama, factual, and a range of other disciplines. So we had finance, HR, all of the other disciplines that you get in an organization. Uh, we had some of the biggest brands in television, and we created them, Top Gear, Doctor Who, Natural History, Dancing with the Stars, but we, were still, we weren't coming up with enough good ideas. Our business was starting to decline because we were failing to come up with enough good ideas. And the fundamental problem was that in a business of 3,000 people, there were only about 150 people who had the job of coming up with ideas. And so we took a view that what we needed to do was to democratize the idea generation process and bring 3,000 people into it. And so we created a platform called BBC I Create. Now, when we did co-star at the Travel Channel, these mass collaboration platforms were in their infancy and, and Travel Channel was small enough with 150 people that we did it on PowerPoint and with paper. But when you got 3,000 people in bases all over the UK, um, platforms like Ideascale are uh, absolutely central if you're going to make this process work. And what we were able to do with um, iCreate is take the elements of CoStar, the, the same six elements, customer, opportunity, story, team, advantage, results, and embed them into uh, the ideas generation platform. Um, some, some interest in learning about how you, when you're dealing with a large organization, first of all, people have to understand why you're doing it. Otherwise, it becomes a bit like an old fashioned ideas box that you're asking people to drop ideas into. So they have to understand what the need is and what their role is. Um, the second thing is, you, you have to understand, they have to understand why the customer and opportunity questions are so important. Most people just want to do the solution. And if you want to be able to understand the relative value of one idea against another, the customer and opportunity insight is critical to helping you understand where to spend your time and your money developing the ideas that have the most value. Um, the third thing is that um, you get quite a lot of people in the business who don't want to submit ideas but are happy to comment on the ideas of others and they are really, really valuable. Um, so with iCreate, we invited 3,000 people to join. About 1,900 came into the system at any one time. Uh, probably about 350 were ideas submitters but we had another four or 500 who were also ideas commenters. And it's that mixture of submission and comment that you need to make these platforms work. And the final thing that I'd say is that you have to, a platform as a platform isn't enough. You have to think about this as a community and you have to build the community and you have to nurture it. And you have to give people reasons to keep coming back to the site. So you have to update them on how ideas are doing. If ideas fall, you have to tell them why they've fallen. 
um, if ideas have gone to the next stage, you, you want to update people about where that is and why that is and what the challenges are. You may need to think about reward and remuneration. Uh, if somebody's idea gets adopted, um, is there a, you know, what's the reward implication? Um, at the BBC, we said there wasn't one. We were very clear that this is what we're paid to do. Um, but in other businesses, you, you may have a different policy. Uh, and those are the things that you need to think about in order to make the platform work. The platform in and of itself won't do it for you. Uh, you have to lead it and you have to engage with it. And I'd say the biggest, biggest benefit, I mean, so at the BBC, very early on, we had a, a, an early hit. A, a guy who worked in health and safety in London submitted a comedy idea um, uh, about a dad bringing up kids on his own. Um, a woman who worked in Scotland, about 400 miles away, in education, read that idea and submitted some mm -hmm. thoughts about how to make it stronger. And on the basis of that, that idea was picked up and taken to script. Now, a couple of things. First of all, we never asked anybody in health and safety for ideas ever. Secondly, he would never have met the woman who lives in Scotland who had the unique insight that took his idea to another level. Uh, that's where these platforms are very, very powerful. Um, you don't know what untapped um, skills and abilities you have in your organization, and you also don't know who has that unique insight that can take an otherwise pedestrian idea and take it to another level. So um, I'm totally open to take questions, but yeah, I create, um, I left the BBC in 2014. We launched I Create at late 2012. By the time I left, we'd already started to generate commissions, as in you know, reward, we started to get new programs commissioned, but also people felt more engaged with the business. People actually felt that the business cared about what they had to say, what they thought, and they felt that they could influence the future of the business. And if you're running a business, you'll know that money can't buy you that in terms of keeping a workforce engaged. Thank you, Pat. That was very, very refreshing. That was very insightful too. Uh, one thing I like about CoStar really is the norm the normalization piece, really, where there are different ideas that come in that are kind of you know, and CoStar helps normalize and kind of select. Even the even the selection piece can be uh, can be done on a level playing field where you have different ideas, but they're all kind of structured in a way where you can actually you know compare one idea to the other based on the CoStar values, really. Uh, so we can switch to uh, a Q and A session right now. So if you have questions, uh, uh, and uh, you can just post them, and uh, I'll ask the questions to both Herman and Pat uh, over here. I have a couple of questions myself, um, and the first question is to uh, Herman. Um, Herman, uh, we here in the Silicon Valley uh, obviously hear about billion-dollar exits and companies going up in flames all the time. Uh, you know, is your opinion that you know enterprises are not taking enough risk to be innovative? Is that the is that the elephant in the room? Um, what what are your thoughts? Well, I actually, I mean, I, I kind of uh, mentioned that a little earlier when I showed that uh, that graphic from Business Week. I think actually that enterprises are taking mostly the wrong risks. They don't have processes that allow them to effectively manage risk. And again. You know, installing and and I think Pat made a wonderful uh, uh, you know point about that as well. Is that when you can get people like this health and safety guy to develop an idea, it doesn't cost you anything. It only brings benefit, right? It's low risk actually. So there's not you know the things that we're proposing don't mean that somehow people have to jump into some highly risky behavior. Quite the opposite. You're opening up the the, the arena so that people at a very low risk level can engage, can offer themselves up. And you know, at some point, yeah, maybe you'll invest some money in it, but you're gonna invest your money into something that is well argued, right? That that story that Pat talked about with this show, by the time it went to the, the, the to the people who actually had to fund it, it was really well developed. It had been vetted by the community, it had been looked at by a lot of people, it had you know, and the innovator himself had confidence that it, had, it was a highly valuable thing that he would be able to take to fruition, right, to the market, to a market that will then succeed. You know, the, 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 the food versus uh, man versus food is another great story, right? It was very low risk to, to engage, to start it up, to get a really good value proposition together. By the time they actually made the investments that they later made, 
it was already a very well developed kind of idea that 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 uh, that uh, was not very risky anymore. Right. So, so, so I actually think it's a misnomer. You know, often we we beat up on corporations and say you're just not taking enough risk. I think it's quite the opposite. It's that we they don't use these kind of methodologies that we just talked about to reduce the risk. Got it. So what you're saying is more process than risk oriented, really. Uh, Absolutely. Pat, Pat uh, talk to us about the state of innovation in media. I mean, you've been in media for quite a while, obviously. So talk to us about what are your thoughts on why media, you know, is not innovating, you know, or is being disrupted in in many different ways. What what are your thoughts around that? Well, the the main reason media is being disrupted is that the existing model isn't quite yet a fully burning platform like print is. The existing model is still profitable, uh, but uh, the margin is declining and there's a lot of margin pressure. Um, and what's happened is that they've left this whole greenfield space into which other people have just come totally over the top. So, you know, you get a Netflix who look at the rollout of, you know, who actually evolved their model from DVDs by post to, to streaming to now a global streaming service. And you have this bizarre situation where HBO are now having to play catch up with Netflix when HBO were there many, many years before them. Um, and the problem is that the existing business model isn't quite bust yet. And so everybody's hanging on to it and trying to squeeze the, the last, last ounce of value out of it. Um, rather than thinking about what the new thing is. And the new thing is a different paradigm. You know, content will cost less to produce. Uh, content is being produced more democratically in more places. There'll be a greater value on things like curation. Um, and that so challenges so many people. It's a bit like Kodak and all these other um, you know, people who are in leadership positions that the, the thought of actually addressing that um, is, is too much for most organizations. Um, even within the BBC, when we launched um, CoStar and iCreate, the biggest pushback we got were from the 150 to 200 people whose jobs it was previously to come up with ideas. In some ways, they felt that their uh, their role was being devalued or that um, their unique skills, um, we were basically saying that anybody could do them. Um, but the reality was we were actually trying to do something very, very different. Um, they were more akin to people trying to have a Eureka, eureka moment, um, and we were trying to set up something much more systematic. Uh, but they were probably the biggest pushback group to the whole exercise. That's a good point. I mean, it's innovation is still 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. So if you're looking for the Eureka moment, you might never get it. But if you actually have a process and a mechanism in place, then you might actually come up with incremental ideas and incremental processes that can, even, that can make even changes. Even if you get it, you may not know that you've got it. Yep. Um, right. That's the joy of CoStar. It gives you a chance to look at it against other things and ask yourself, what could this be? All right. Um, a question from uh, from one of the audience uh, members, uh, and uh, Pat, you touched on it a little bit, uh, and Herman, you can jump into uh, in your you know in terms of rewards and kind of compensation and incentives. Really, uh, what are you guys' kind of thought around kind of how how do you motivate people to kind of you know f get fired up about this? Is it just participation in terms of you know affecting the business? Like Pat, you said, you know people are interested in kind of getting closer to the business, affecting change, that in itself is a motivating factor, obviously, for iCreate. You guys don't actually, you know, give out any money or give out any kind of, you know, rewards based on, based on, you know, uh, commissioning of the, uh, of the, of the programs. But I, but I think the question from the audience is, um, you know, are there any strategies that have worked better than others in terms of, you know, motivating and engaging um, employees specifically? There's a really, really good um, animation called RSA space drive. The Royal Society of Arts have an animation called Drive, which, which is a cautionary tale on what happens if you introduce financial rewards for skilled workers. Um, and normally, if you introduce financial rewards for skilled workers, actually what happens is productivity and creativity goes down. Um, what they want to be recognised for is mastery of their of their craft um, and the opportunity to self-expression um, as opposed to purely cash rewards. The, the other challenge that we had uh, with, with something like iCreate is 
if if the if if you introduce a financial reward, why should I build somebody else's idea if they're going to get the reward? Um, why don't I just um, put my own idea in, and maybe my idea, which is very similar to that idea, uh, will be the one that wins the prize. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do financial rewards, but you need to think about them in the context of of a team or a business unit. Um, because anything which drives people against collaboration drives against the power of the platform. I think that's right. And and the other thing that comes to mind is this sort of shift of identity that I, I showed in the very first slide I showed, um, you know, from the St. Peter's Plaza is that we are changing as human beings. I We're doing some work with a, a local uh, unified school district and one of the students said, uh, one of the parents said every time his son comes home, he says, now I can get back to the future. I've just been in 1950. Um, and I think <clears throat> people are motivated, right? Everybody's on Facebook. Everybody's engaging with texting, with all those kind of things. People are motivated by exchanging ideas, by moving things forward, by learning from each other, by supporting each other. And when companies don't do that, it feels like the old days. It, it, it really zaps people's motivation. And, and you know, what, what's really interesting in is, is also that back to the identity point is that people are managing their profiles and you know being part of an innovation activity like the one we're describing gives them a, an identification they are becoming somebody different that that man who was a safety officer for the BBC is now a content creator he is a new person that's extremely invigorating he can go to, to something he had never imagined before so that part of the, the benefit from such a platform, and you know, again, Pat spoke about it as well, is that, that it generates a very different atmosphere in the workplace. Great, great. Um, I mean, uh, I think a follow-up question, I think Susan was asking about you know, our uh, idea scale. CoStar is enabled uh, for most of our enterprise clients. It, uh, it's, as you can see online, you can just go ahead and turn it on. Uh, there may, it really depends upon your licensing level. Her question really was, is it available for everybody um, who have enterprise licenses with IdeaScale? And the, answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, uh, I think, um, you know, those are most of the questions um, that I had. If there are other questions in the, in the, from the audience, um, then I can take them on. Um, I think a, a good one came up from Kirk, um, and this is to Pat. Uh, how do you envision iCreate innovating and evolving itself? Uh, that's an interesting one. So how, how do you envision like iCreate itself changes um, in terms of how they how they source and collect and you know evolve itself? That's a good one. So what what we did with iCreate was that um, we started off with a if you want an open call to idea, so anybody could submit any idea about anything. Um, we then decided to change it slightly and to um, do it on a sort of rotating basis. So one month would be an open call for ideas. The next month we would actually put a business-led stimulus into the system. I don't know, we need more programs that appeal to young women and here's, here's what young women are doing and here's what we know in terms of research and information uh, and now come up with your ideas. Um, so we, we, we sort of went, we then started moving between a very directional approach one month to a much more free form, free form approach uh, the following month, and, and that was pretty successful. And then after that, um, what we started to do was then bring in people from outside of the television division. So we started bringing people in from technology, from children's, from radio, and they were great. They're like grit and an oyster because they look at things totally differently to the whole of the television team. So they are able to look at ideas through a totally different uh, set of perspectives. And then finally, what we allowed groups to do was to set up their own groups within the platform. So we set up a gaming group, uh, and that was a space for gamers to go in and kick around ideas themselves and to share stuff themselves within the platform, even if we weren't asking them for gaming ideas. So um, you can see how the platform evolves, but you do have to work at building the community. So we would send out an email every Monday afternoon saying, um, how many new ideas have gone in over the past seven days? How many comments have come in? Um, we had a, a guest editor um, who would come into the system on Friday. They would pick their idea of the week, and that person would win some gift vouchers. And they'd also pick their build of the week. That 
the person who's not made put in an idea but has contributed to somebody else's idea and that person would win the same amount of gift vouchers. Um, we introduced a, a, um, a window where a very prominent member of the business who may, many people in the business may admire their work but wouldn't necessarily be able to talk to normally, we would have them to come in and do a live chat just like this. Uh, and so we'd use the platform as part of the social glue of the organization um, to get people talking to each other and that would be the person who would then pick the best idea and the best builder. So there are a number of things that we did but it was all about building and maintaining and strengthening the community. Uh, that's a good point you bring about curation really. I mean I think it's interesting to have kind of you know we at Ideascale think a lot about moderation but you know curation also becomes an important aspect of the success of uh, uh, any community um, and having you know having people you know come in and you know manually select and curate a couple of things and uh, and push things forward uh, is actually an interesting uh, I think that's what makes the community gives it a you know gives it a living breathing exercise really well the, um, the other thing is leaders so I would expect my leaders and by that I mean my business leaders and functional leaders to be publicly in the system at least once a week commenting ideas um, even putting ideas of their own in um, because that also shows people that the system is taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we're almost out of time but I have uh, one final question over here uh, and it involves consumer research and I'm interested uh, Herman uh, bo bo either of you guys can chime in over here uh, you know once ideas are posted uh, the question is around is consumer research done before ideas are posted on CoStar or, or can it be done after the fact saying that look these are the ideas then kind of go do, go do some more kind of anecdotal slash even kind of empirical research around uh, around a particular construct uh, how have you guys seen you know companies do that do they have a separate research division that goes and sifts through ideas and then do some does some research or do you do the research po you know pre or post facto can you can you address that question yeah, uh, uh, just quickly, and then Pat, please uh, chime in as well. Uh, I think it's it's consumer research in this context belongs there all the time. So you know the platform like I create has a, 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 an aspect to it that continuously feeds information into the community, right? So when when there's con consumer research that 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 identifies really interesting territories, interesting developments, that just goes up on the site. That is presented broadly so that, you know, that enriches the site and people can, can see it and get inspired by it and start developing ideas. Once ideas go in, of course, again, consumer insight, consumer research is critical in companies like Universal Music. Uh, you know the, the 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 consumer research folks get engaged and then see an idea and they'll they'll go into the co-star they present their you know they contribute to the the material their material to the idea they help optimize it improve it they get actively engaged in it for for us i create um was an important um venue for our audience research people but also our business development people right. um but first of all, to share what knowledge and insight they had, but also we encourage people to share things with us that you know we we didn't see. I mean, one of the simplest things we did um, was we just said we almost set up a virtual book club. We just said, if you're reading a book and you think it would make great television, just write a synopsis of it here, because the drama department can only read so many books, and you know our drama department had a you know as all departments culturally was 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 very you know um, similar um, and so suddenly you had people from uh, all ranges of, of the business and all sort of walks of life suddenly reading books and just writing short synopsis and so suddenly the drama department have all this extra firepower all this extra audience research about books that are out there in the market that they wouldn't have known about and probably wouldn't have read and suddenly they're getting a synopsis and they can decide whether or not that book is worth reading or it's worth getting a writer to read so Yes, the formal market intelligence is, is valuable, but I, I would say for the power of these systems is what comes up from beneath. And so the insight that comes from the people themselves, you know, the magazines they read, the website they were on, did you know, the did you know, though you know, finding space for people to share that stuff is, is sort of vital to the health of the system. 
All right. That's that's great. Um, I'll, uh, we're almost out of time. I'll, I'll depart with some some final final parting thoughts. Really, uh, you know, one the one thing that I think about a lot is, you know, how do you define uh, the word innovation itself? And the way I define it, at least, it's it's creativity plus execution, really. So you got to be creative and you got to be able to deliver on that. Uh, and what CoStar does is really fit in well with the execution piece, really. So you know, we you know, creativity is an interesting, interesting art uh, that cannot be really kind of taught uh, to some extent. Um, and then the execution part uh, with CoStar makes it much, much easier for you know business managers like uh, like Pat to evaluate and address uh, address uh, ideas, and they they go from being ideas to you know innovation really. Um, that's those are my thoughts. Uh, again, it's been a great, refreshing webinar. Thank you, every thank you everyone for showing up. Um, we will be we've already obviously recorded this conversation, um, and we will be sending out the slides as well as uh, a recording a YouTube video of this uh, of this webinar to everybody who's registered for the webinar. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Herman Gurr one more time. Thank you very much for showing up and uh, you know uh, being a good friend as well as being part of this conversation. And Pat Young, uh, thank you for very very much for you know enlightening us with you know all the things that you've done with the Travel Channel and the BBC. And we look forward to having you guys uh, again on another webinar in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.